Welcome to the Wolverine.com podcast, the Maize and Blue Breakdown. Clayton Safey with a, a known friend and trusted agent, Austin Fox. We're from the Wolverine.com. You can use the promo code BLUE60 to become a member of our message board, get all of our premium articles for two months for free, just an absolutely risk-free trial. Promo code BLUE60 at the Wolverine.com. Austin, what, what's up? How we doing, man? Known friend and trusted agent. I uh, I like that title. I think uh, someone referred to you the other day as a uh, trusted accomplice or something like that on the message board. I could be wrong, but I thought I read that. But I'm doing pr- pretty good because of this Michigan basketball team. They got back on track against Maryland last night, bouncing back from that disappointing loss at Minnesota. So it was really good to see them show a lot of mental toughness and grit and destroy a Maryland team who uh, was playing fairly well coming in. I know Maryland's not that great of a team, but when you crush any Big Ten opponent the way Michigan did the other night at Chrysler, I think you have to be very, very happy with the performance overall. I ask you how you're doing, and we get some just great analysis. Also, accomplice, um, that sounds a little more sinister you know, than a <laughs> known friend and, and trusted agent, but I guess I'll take that. Actually, I had the term wrong. I was thinking of a correspondent. You sent me a text, I think, referring to yourself as Duncan Robinson's correspondent. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah. I got called that at one point because doing the NBA updates over at thewolverine.com last year, you know, especially in the finals, revolved a lot around Duncan Robinson. Someone labeled me as a Duncan Robinson correspondent. I will take that. Uh, Fastest player to ever reach uh, to hit 300 threes in their NBA career in NBA history 95 games only took Duncan Robinson to do that he shattered the record so I will gladly take the title as Duncan Robinson correspondent maybe I'll switch my Twitter bio and and put that in there I don't see why not that's actually absolutely incredible what Duncan Robinson has done in the NBA and honestly you could pass for Duncan Robinson you're both quite tall you're both outstanding basketball players and both automatic from deep so if somebody mistaked you for Duncan Robinson, I really would not be surprised at all. Hey, I mean, I'll take that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, he's probably he's like six seven, six eight. I'm like six one or six two. Um, but, really? You know, if you translate that over to like pickup basketball heights, maybe then I guess you know you could have a case for that. But I'll take that as well. I can shoot. We're you know we're similar type shooters, I would say. So. Um, I'll, I'll take it. Um, yeah, so let's let's talk about this Michigan basketball team. We'll get into the loss against Minnesota in a bounce-back win over Maryland. Um, and then we'll talk about the new Michigan football assistant coaching hires. And the complete defensive coaching staff is now set. Uh, they retained a couple guys. They brought in a couple guys, so we'll talk about that. Obviously, we've discussed Mike McDonald, the new D coordinator, but uh, he has a co-defensive coordinator with him now and all that. Um, we'll get to that. At the end, but we'll start with the Michigan basketball. And let's talk about that game last Saturday against Minnesota. Um, I think this is a team Michigan matches up well against. But when you don't have Eli Brooks, who shut down Marcus Carr the first time around, he couldn't get anywhere. He couldn't get in the lane like he likes to. Um, I think he gets the most ball screens in the Big Ten. And Eli is one of the best ball screen on ball defenders in the Big Ten, if not the best, if not one of the best in the country. So uh, he made life difficult for him that first time around. This was a Minnesota team that had six days off in between the game, uh, in between their last game and the game against Michigan. They were kind of stewing about that loss the first time just 10 days prior. And they came out, didn't play crazy good but I thought Minnesota played well enough without Eli Brooks Marcus Carr was just getting wherever he wanted uh, I think he had six assists um, and you know he didn't shoot the ball necessarily well but Liam Robbins their big man the junior Drake transfer wanted some revenge on Hunter Dickinson who had dropped 28 on him the first time it was just kind of that revenge game for Minnesota it was, it was the perfect storm Minnesota wanted revenge um, you know you had a Michigan team without Eli Brooks, the best defender and a very good offensive player, kind of that glue guy on offense. And um, you had a Michigan team that turned it over 20 times. They couldn't make a shot when they did have open looks. It was the perfect storm. It was probably overdue, to be completely honest, with with this Michigan basketball team because they were undefeated coming in and really uh, just about every team in the country. I think there's only six left that are undefeated out of teams that have played games. So 
they were probably overdue for that performance. You had some people jump off the bandwagon, but whatever. They're back on after the, the win against Maryland. But I guess your thoughts overall just on that Minnesota loss and um, you know, just, just the way it went. Yeah, there really isn't a whole lot to say about this one, in my opinion, because you summed it up pretty well there. That's all it was. It was just a bad game and nothing more. And bad games happen to great teams every single year in college basketball. We've seen it happen to Michigan's great teams in the past. That 2013 Michigan team that went to the national title obviously suffered immensely throughout February and had several bad games. The 2018 Michigan team who went to the national title turned in a pathetic performance at Northwestern in February, a bad Northwestern team and only scored, I believe, 52 points. So you have off nights, you have bad games, and that's all this past Saturday was. And this week's win over Maryland proved that uh, 20 turnovers were obviously Michigan's downfall in that game. The inability to get into any rhythm whatsoever on offense obviously was another downfall. Not having Eli Brooks uh, hindered Michigan's offense immensely as well. So it was an all-around bad game. You talked about Minnesota junior seven-foot center Liam Robbins wanting revenge. Richard Patino talked about that after the game. He said Robbins was fired up for this one. After the way, Hunter Dickinson just abused him at Chrysler Center a week and a half prior to that. So Robbins got the better of Dickinson this time around. He put up 22 points. Star point guard Marcus Carr had a much, much better game this time around. I believe he put up 17 points after Michigan did a very good job on him at Chrysler in the first meeting. So, again, that's all it was. It was a bad game. Isaiah Liver said after the game that he admitted some guys were a little bit complacent and they weren't locked in and focused as much as they should have been, and that was pretty obvious because Michigan was sloppy from the get-go on Saturday. You said this was overdue. I could not agree more. Michigan was not going to keep playing at the the high level that they had been playing at, so it's actually amazing that a bad performance like this didn't happen sooner. You can make the case that Michigan only had had one subpar performance prior to Saturday's game, and that was the Oakland game, which they still came out and won and put up 81 points. So when the Big Ten is as tough as it is, you're going to have bad performances like this. It's nothing to freak out about. And the biggest takeaway to me was the fact that Michigan bounced back in incredible fashion and showed that they were focused and that they learned from their Minnesota loss by blowing out Maryland the other night. Yeah, and that's exactly where I was going to take that is when you look at what Minnesota was doing, bringing the hard doubles at Hunter Dickinson, he had five turnovers on Saturday. Um, You know, they were absolutely all in the face of anyone cutting. You know, I think Michigan made some bad decisions because of the pressure in their face. They were really pressuring Mike Smith um, out on the perimeter when he was bringing the ball over half court. When you look at the things they did, and Phil Martelli talked about this uh, prior to the Maryland game, how hey, the blueprint is out there to beat us now because somebody did so. It, it's our job to make adjustments. It's our job to play better, get back to playing our game. It helps you had Eli Brooks back, but when you look at specifically what Michigan did against Maryland, um, where you had great passing, the ball was just being fired around the perimeter. Uh, they're moving the ball. They get it into Hunter Dickinson. Sure enough, Maryland was bringing those double teams. I think one thing uh, – Mark Turgeon did not want to get beat by the kid from the hometown again that said, you know, Maryland didn't recruit him well enough and, you know, he didn't want to get embarrassed. So they're bringing double teams every time at Hunter Dickinson. He looked more under control. He was making the right read. And then he he just, you know, sometimes he'd fire it across and, and skip past it to a guy wide open. Sometimes uh, he would just get it right out back to the three point line. And then that guy would make an extra pass and then, it'd, you know, be a ball reversal. So um, he was making the right read. Sometimes it's just a simple play. I'm getting doubled. Just get it back out. And then, you know, they're going to have to scramble and recover. And that's how you exploit, you know, a double team. If they can't get their hand on the ball, which it's hard to do against Hunter Dickinson, and you make the right decision, you're likely going to get an open look out of it. And Michigan was deadly on Tuesday night shooting the three. 50%. They were 12 for 24. Uh, Incredible performance led by Isaiah Livers, who had 20 points. Now, four of those points came on the technical free throws, but... Uh, he was outstanding in this game. Mike Smith was hitting threes early. Then it was Livers. And then it, it was Michigan getting off to a 17-3 to lead. And they never looked back. And I think, you know, Austin, you mentioned it was just kind of that one game. And we both said that they were overdue for a performance like that against Minnesota. I think we were proved right. And I guess we said it after the fact. So it's not nothing crazy. But we were proved right by the fact that Michigan just got right back to what they were doing coming into that Minnesota game. And probably learned some of those lessons. Because it's not the last time 
that teams are going to just sprint right at Hunter Dickinson with two guys, sometimes three guys on him and Austin Davis down there. Mark Turgeon did not want to get beat again by uh, Michigan's big men. Um, and, you know, it's not the last time they're going to face that. They learned their lesson and they moved on. Uh, John Beeline was talking with uh, Bill Simonson of the Huge Show last week going into that Minnesota game. And he said, you know, this is an undefeated team. If they go undefeated the rest of the season, then great. But if they don't, then that'll probably benefit them as well. And I think we kind of saw that all come to fruition uh, after the fact because of just the way that Michigan beat Maryland. It wasn't just a 24-point win. It was the way they did it against the style of play that Maryland was bringing. Exactly. It was the way Michigan pummeled Maryland, not just the fact that they beat them soundly. Again, this Maryland team had done some very impressive things on the year. They had won at Wisconsin. They had won at Illinois recently without Eric Ayala, their star junior guard, and he actually returned for this game. And obviously it didn't make much of a difference. It was just good to see Michigan come out of the gate with their foot on the gas. Uh, like you said, they jumped out to that 17-3 to lead. This game was over before it even began, and that's the sign of a very – very focused and locked in Michigan team. They were on fire from three. I believe they started five for five from deep, if I'm not mistaken. Isaiah Livers was four for five. Mike Smith was three of five. They were just clicking on all cylinders all game long, and it was great to see. The defense was uh, taken to a very high level once again, not to say they played bad defense at Minnesota, but it was just stifling. The other night against Maryland, I forget. I think Maryland shot 41% for the game. Michigan really couldn't do much wrong against Maryland. And it's good to see Michigan be able to win at a high level when Hunter Dickinson isn't scoring 15, 16, 17 points a game. This team is so balanced and they can beat you in so many different ways. Mike Smith now leads the Big Ten in assists per game. He's averaging 5.8. He has been such a godsend for this Michigan team at point guard with the graduation of Xavier Simpson from last year. I think he's exceeding everyone's expectations. Uh, my own included. I'll be honest, I did not have high expectations for him when he came here, but he's been outstanding so far. And I just can't stress enough how Saturday's bad performance at Minnesota was nothing more than just that a bad afternoon. There's nothing to freak out about. This Michigan team is still in great shape, and I'm really excited to see how they follow up the Maryland performance tomorrow night on, in a tough road game at Purdue. Bro, Mike Smith is shooting 69%, I believe, from three in Big Ten play. Uh, that, incredible, the, you know, the the job he's done. He wasn't even shooting that well in the non-conference either. That's that's the big thing. Um, because, like, he just seemed to kind of ease his way in. He was facilitating early on and, you know, easing his way into the offense. It was almost the perfect way to get himself up to speed in the Big Ten because he started out like, hey, I'm not going to look for my shot. We all kind of knew he could score, at least in the Ivy League. Now he's getting these spot up, you know, three point opportunities. He's knocking them down. We all knew he could shoot. He's also dishing out five, six, seven assists per game. He had 10 against Minnesota. He was held scoreless. Uh, but Mike Smith has been, you said a godsend. Uh, I think that's a perfect word to describe it because Michigan was lacking in that department, especially after David DeJulius transferred and Xavier Simpson, obviously the, the heartbeat of that team at the point guard spot graduated. Um, so he's been incredible. And, and then you mentioned the Purdue game, how Michigan's going to follow this up. It's going to be a challenge. Purdue is playing, like, I guess, I don't know if we can call Michigan hot anymore because, you know, they're one and one in their last two or whatever. But at the same time, you look at it and, you know, they've won, what, they're 12 and one. So you can kind of consider them hot. Uh, Purdue's hot. Um, and you know, I, I just beating Ohio state the other night, I think that, that kind of opened everyone's eyes and I tweeted it too. Like it's, it's going to be a fun game on Friday night in West Lafayette. It would be uh, a crazy atmosphere if fans were allowed in Mackey. But when you look at this um, Purdue team, it's Travion Williams, a guy who dropped, I think 32 points against Michigan at Chrysler last year in that double overtime thriller before Michigan started bringing a little bit more help down low on some of these big men. Uh, Sasha Stavanovich is a very good shooter, but man, I mean, there's not a team in the big 10. I mean, maybe you could say Iowa in the way they play offense, but there's not a team in the big 10 that I look at their lineup. I look at what their guys can do. I watch their games and I say, this is a bad matchup for Michigan. Um, just because of the defense really. 
And then the offense will kind of figure itself out. Michigan's starting to win in different ways on offense. We talked about the way they're doing it with, you know, early on in the year, it was Hunter Dickinson scoring 20. He had 28, you know, in some games, 26 at Maryland the first time. Then he had three points the other night, and it was the shooting. Isaiah Livers leading the charge. Mike Smith leading the charge. Franz Wagner with 15 points the other night. So uh, they're winning in different ways on offense. They're defending at an extremely high level. So I think it, it, Michigan's going to be tough to beat. If they play well, I think they're going to win this game. But at the same time, Purdue does enough things that they can kind of take you out of your game as well. And it's going to be a battle. Ken Palm's only got this as a Michigan uh, two-point victory. So, you know, it's projected to be close. And Purdue's playing great basketball. So, you know, you might lose another game. Um, and you certainly don't want to because right now you're in first place in the Big Ten. But, um, you know, it, it's certainly a possibility here. And, and you know, if you would have looked at this game two weeks ago, uh, you would have said it's a much easier matchup than, you know, what we're saying now. Yeah, the way Purdue is playing lately has really changed my opinion on this game about a week and a half or two weeks ago. This was probably looked at as a comfortable Michigan victory for most people. But again, Purdue has heated up since then. And I believe it was Tuesday night's win at Ohio State has only reinforced that. They also beat Penn State on Sunday. Uh, obviously, they won at MSU the other Friday when they only put up 55 points. But that's just it. They're finding ways to win. They've won their last four games. And Michigan has not played well at Mackey. In recent years, I realize fans won't be there tomorrow night, but they won there last year, and that was Michigan's first win there since 2014. So it's still a very, very difficult place to play. You look at Purdue's stats, and nobody really stands out with the exception of six foot ten junior center Travion Williams, who's averaging 15 points and nine boards per game. They really don't have any star players, but they just know how to get the job done. And I think Matt Painter is an exceptional coach, one of the best in the Big Ten, uh, maybe my second favorite coach in the Big Ten behind Jawan Howard. I've always had a lot of respect for Matt Painter. He just seems like a normal, down-to-earth guy, the kind of guy, kind of guy that you'd go out and grab a beer with. So I just think he's a he's an all-around good dude and a great coach. So he's going to have Purdue ready to play tomorrow night, man. This is a, this is going to be a grind. It's going to be a dogfight. You mentioned that Ken Palm only has a two-point Michigan victory. I think that's pretty much spot on. This game's a toss-up. And I've gone back and forth on this one. I wouldn't be surprised one bit if Purdue was able to pull this one out tomorrow night. What kind of beer would Matt Painter order, you think, at a bar? He seems like a pretty fancy guy, so I'm thinking more of a, a Heineken or, or a fancy IPA, uh, something along those lines. Probably not a Bush Light. Yeah. Yeah, at the same time, like you said, he's a down-to-earth guy. Um, you like IPA? You like craft beer? You know, I've been drinking them a bit more lately. I had quite a few between the holidays and this Christmas season. I'm not the biggest fan. I don't dislike them, but I would take a light beer any day of the week over a fancy IPA. Yeah, that's fair. I think there's a time and a place. Two-Hearted is uh, my favorite, I'd say, IPA. Okay. See, I, I have not bought any IPAs on my own. They've all been handed to me from other people. So, honestly, I don't even know what I was drinking half the time, but... I don't know. I'm not the biggest fan. They all taste the same to me. I think a lot of people would disagree with that, but I really don't notice a difference between most of them. That's fair. Well, the free beer over the holiday sounds, uh, you know, sounds good to me. Um, back to back to Purdue. Uh, I agree with you on Matt Painter. I would love to to grab a beer with him if we're if we're still on the beer thing. But um, yeah, I mean, this is. I'm excited to watch. Uh, Hunter Dickinson, I'm sure he'll be matched up at times with Travion Williams, but also Zach Eady, seven foot four for them. I mean, <laughs> I didn't know about this kid until, you know, the beginning of the season, like the first game of the year. And he was kind of going viral on Twitter because people were saying, man, I mean, Purdue just grows these guys in like, you know, they have some sort of factory there for these guys that are over seven foot. Seven foot four is ridiculous. Hunter Dickinson looks big out there. John Teske looked big out there, both at seven foot one. Uh, Zach Eady looks massive out there. He can't move as well. He's not that good. I mean, he's averaging what eight points and four boards a game. But this is uh, this is going to be just fun to watch in terms of just seeing uh, th that big of a guy match up against Hunter. Yeah, what's with Purdue and these uh, seven footers in recent years? Matt Harms was seven foot three, the 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 tall lanky guy from the Netherlands here a few years ago, and then prior to that, Isaac Haas was seven foot two, and you've now you've got. Zach Eady at 7'4", A.J. Hammonds was a monster 
before Isaac Haas. So <laughs> Matt Painter uh, knows what he's doing when he's bringing in centers. But like you said, Zach Eady really isn't all that good. He's only averaging eight points and four boards, like you said, and only plays 14 minutes. So I think conditioning is probably a bit of an issue with him. With that being said, he's still probably one of the best freshmen in the Big Ten and what's a pretty weak crop this year behind Hunter Dickinson. I had never heard of him either before the season started. He was only a three-star out of high school, so it's not like he was a big prospect or anything. But I think Dickinson, honestly, will do just fine against Edie. And the Dickinson-Travion match matchup down low is potentially what will wind up deciding this game. He went to IMG. Uh, Zach Edie went to IMG Academy. If he went anywhere else, then... I think he, I mean, the high school clips of him would have been incredible because IMG plays a national, really good schedule. But imagine him just at your local high school, uh, just getting buckets over some of these kids. Like you, you see centers that are like my, my height, six, one, six, two sometimes in high school. Yeah. Yeah. He would have had probably well over a foot on most of his, uh, opposite <laughs> in high school. So, uh, I can't imagine how many points and rebounds he averaged in high school. I would hope it would be a lot. I actually saw a highlight clip of him in one of Purdue's recent games playing baseball. And he just looked out of place. And the highlight was him hitting a grounder. And I think it was a ground out. So (laughs) I don't know if that was his only baseball highlight. I don't think he was a very good player. But uh, he just looks a little bit awkward out there. And I don't think that he's going to be quite as good as Isaac Haas and Travion Williams is now. We'll see. We'll see. I don't know where he gets these guys, Matt Painter. But uh, yeah, so it'll be that'll be an exciting game for a Friday night. <clears throat> I like the little change of pace sometimes on some of these Friday nights, so it'll be awesome. Uh, Michigan is bussing down to West Lafayette as we speak. The basketball team, which I thought was interesting, they're not flying, but they're bussing down. Uh, and we'll be in town here tonight, Thursday, ahead of the Friday game. Uh, Jawan Howard, as he does on every road trip, will be hitting that behind-the-back half-court shot, one-handed, beautiful stroke and sometimes you hear you watch that video that they post on twitter every time and and the guys will be yelling first try first try now i don't know if they're doing that just to give Joan a little more clout on twitter but he hits those things routinely and you know i don't think he he's not one to waste some time in practice to hit those so you know he probably you know hits those at least in in the first few tries what, what do you think about Joan's shots on these some of these road trips he does it every single road trip, doesn't he? They post it on Twitter. Yeah. I don't remember a road trip where he hasn't done it. I would love to know how many attempts he's doing before he makes it. I couldn't agree more. I don't think it's many. I would guess anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20 at most because he's not going to waste time doing that. So it's incredible that he can still make that shot. Uh, he has so much game. I think he's prob- he could probably beat half the players on his team if they played one-on-one, I bet. So he's still incredibly athletic. And again, I've never really seen anybody make that shot as consistently as he does. I mean, that's a unique shot. I've I've never seen anyone really attempt that that often uh, at all. Um, So Juwan Howard and Michigan taking on Purdue on Friday night. Let's get into some of the football hires. Um, Michigan with a new co-defensive coordinator and new safeties coach. They brought back a couple of guys uh, before we get into that. Um, we want to remind you about our sponsor, JFQ Lending. This podcast is brought to you in part by JFQ Lending with interest rates below 3%. There's never been a better time to lock in a low fixed interest rate on your mortgage. You'll never need to think about refinancing again, set it and forget it. And with JFQ Lending, you're guaranteed to get the highest level of customer service. They have an A plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and over 3,000 five star reviews. Give Chris Sabanish a call today at 480 562 6267 or email him directly at csabanish at jfqlending.com. That's C-S-A-B-A-N-O-S-H at jfqlending.com. JFQ Lending Incorporated, equal access lender, licensed in over 40 states, www.jfqlending.com. And then we have a new sponsor, Franchise Coach. Um, Are you displaced corporate executive or wanting to put your career in your own hands? Or are you an experienced entrepreneur looking to diversify? Well, Adam Goldman can help. Adam is a member of the Wolverine.com, a Michigan fan and franchise veteran, having owned a franchise which he recently sold to a strategic buyer. Using his expertise, he helps others find their American dream through a very thorough and free consultation process. Call Adam at 844-800-FRAN to get your life and career in your own hands. You can also visit him online at franchisecoach.com. Dot net. It's 100% free 
Uh, so get that free consultation right now with Adam Goldman, a, a Michigan fan, fellow Michigan fan to uh, everybody out there and member of our message board at the Wolverine.com. So Austin, some of these new hires that Jim Harbaugh is bringing in. First, I want to talk about it in the broader sense. He's looking to get younger on this team, more young, however you want to say it. Um, Scott Bell, our guy, also a member of the Wolverine.com and, and the king of Michigan Twitter. Uh, basically, he, he came out with a tweet the other day and said, this is the average age of Michigan's coaching staff. Last year, and I think it was 46. This year, with all the new hires, it's 36. Uh, and I think that's the assistant coaches. Um, they're getting more youthful. They look like they're emphasizing guys that want to recruit. They look like they're emphasizing guys that have unlimited energy to turn this thing around. And, you know, something we had heard from a source close to Maurice Ling was that EJ Holland posted on the Wolverine.com message board is basically um, before he was even announced as being hired, first of all, kids were tweeting out offers and tagging him. And, you know, he had clearly been offering kids, which is by the book, by the way. Um, but we're just saying before he was even the ink was dry on his contract, he was already working. We heard from his camp that it was uh, he's ready to go. He's ready to bring championships back to Michigan, and he is you know going to recruit like crazy and seems to be doing that. So he's got all the energy. He's Michigan's new co-defensive coordinator and corners coach, George Hilo, the new safeties coach, and then Brian Jean Mary is staying on uh, as the linebackers coach, Sean Nua as a defensive line coach, and then, of course, Mike McDonald, who we've talked about. He was officially announced on Sunday as a D coordinator. Uh, a young staff that Jim Harbaugh is bringing in. Your thoughts on just what he's doing philosophically with some of these hires? I do like the fact that he's getting younger and that he's looking for guys who are going to be outstanding recruiters and relentless on the recruiting trail because Michigan has not had enough of those guys. In recent years, Pep Hamilton comes to mind when he was here. He was not viewed as a very good recruiter. I think Sean Nua, the current defensive line coach, fits the bill as well, not to uh, knock these guys, but I think that's just a fact. So the fact that he's uh, getting younger and he wants guys who are going to bust their butt on the recruiting trail. And I also like the fact that a lot of these guys have ties down south. Uh, they've coached at Alabama. They've coached at Georgia. Mike McDonald obviously went to Georgia. He has ties down there. He coached under Kirby Smart at Georgia. George Hilo also coached at Georgia. So it's important to <clears throat> excuse me, get coaches who have ties to the south, which is obviously – the best spot in the entire country for high school football talent. I know a lot of coaches around the country at some of the football factories hire assistants who are great recruiters first and great coaches second. I think they view recruiting as the priority here. Maybe Jim Harbaugh is moving to that philosophy a little bit, but I like that what he's doing. We don't know how these guys will be coaches on the actual set staff and how their position groups will perform under them but again I like the fact that he's getting a bit younger and in my opinion I think it's something he needed to do after the the disastrous season that occurred this past season yeah and it remains to be seen exactly how things will play out we won't know until they're on the field out there but you mentioned the recruiting it certainly looks to be a philosophy that they're they're leaning into uh, but at the same time you look at these guys track records and you did a great job uh, giving synopsis of, of both of the new hires, well, really all of these guys, um, and you're getting to know them article, so everyone can check those out, uh, obviously, on the website. But, like, they're developers as well. When you look at Mo Linguist being the corners coach for the Cowboys last year, like, there's no recruiting there. He's just developing players, putting in scheme, implementing scheme, and, you know, teaching technique and all the, that sorts of thing. Um, so... We, like it, it's not all recruiting with these guys. George Hilo as well. When you look at his track record, he's at Colorado State. Like that's that's not a guy, uh, a place that you're really recruiting at a super high level. Um, and I know he did a good job there recruiting, but it's the bulk of that is developing the guys you can get into really good players and into you know playing t good team football. So when you look at those guys from that respect, we know Brian Jean Mary is a very good recruiter from the linebacker spot. Spot um, Sean Nua heading into his third year. Um, has been a little bit of a disappointment, I think, to some Michigan fans in that regard. Um, but Mike Hart, when you when you want to talk about the offensive side of the ball, and I know we talked about him last week on the pod, but um, I'm talking to – I was at Sound Mind, Sound Body Camp on Monday and talking to different coaches and trainers and you know guys that work for Sound Mind, Sound Body, and, and the way they talk about Mike Hart 
he's going to bring back that in-state recruiting. So while, while there's those ties down in the South with some of these guys that you just mentioned, they're going to try to bring back that in-state. Uh, they've done a good job in the state, but they really should be cleaning up and getting every kid they want. And, you know, some coaches I talked to, some high school coaches, just the other day were saying that's probably exactly what's going to happen. Michigan should have right of first refusal on any top player in the state, and they believe that's going to be the case with Mike Hart coming back, who already has outstanding relationships there from his time recruiting at Western Michigan, Eastern Michigan, even Indiana. Um, so when you look at it as a whole, I, I like this philosophical change. I think at the same time, uh, it could backfire in that they need to turn things around quickly on the field. And, you know, recruiting is a process where, you know, a lot of the kids they're talking to aren't going to be here if they come, you know, for a couple of years. So, and, and when they do, they'll be young. So, if, you know, for a program that needs to turn things around quickly and a head coach that needs to turn things around quickly, um, we'll see if it pays off. But at the same time, uh, they seem to be fantastic hires. And, you know, from what we hear from, you know, everyone close to some of these guys, it, it is, uh, you know, they're bringing on some talent. They're not just young. They're not just recruiters. They're very talented coaches as well. Yeah, you talked about Michigan cleaning up in the state of Michigan on the recruiting trail and the way they should be doing a little bit better at times. I actually spoke with Cast Tech head coach Thomas Wilcher this past offseason, and he was on a media Zoom call with Michigan tight ends coach Sharon Moore, and he said that Sharon Moore told the hundreds of high school football coaches in the state of Michigan that one of their primary goals is to get a better relationship with the Detroit high schools and kind of build that foundation and improve on it because he didn't feel it was where it needed to be. So I think that Mike Hart will definitely help in that regard. I think Mike Hart is a home run hire, but I'm not ready to call any of the other assistants that have been hired home run hires. And I'm also not going to praise them significantly. I'm not going to bash the hires, but this is simply because we don't know. The sample size is so, so small with a lot of these guys. And I think I've jumped the gun a little bit in the past on praising some of these hires. Josh Gaddis being the perfect example. I thought that was a slam dunk hire. And it obviously hasn't played out that way before. So I'm not saying Mike McDonald and George Hilo and Mo Linguist are bad hires by any means. I think they're pretty darn solid. But I'm in wait and see mode. I want to see these guys on the field with their position groups first before I come to any uh, judgments or or uh, assessments about them. I think they could be good, but again, we just don't know. So I'm a cautiously optimistic. I think that's a good way to put it on several of these hires that Jim Harbaugh has made here over the last few weeks. Yeah, and <laughs> I am completely with you. We talked about that with Mike McDonald, how wait and see is the perfect way to describe it. We don't know what scheme he's going to run. I think it's going to be a 3-4 uh, defense, but you don't know what he, what he's going to run, what his philosophy is, what he's going to implement yet. It really, truly is. We will know when they get on the field next fall, you know, to be completely honest. Um, and, you know, we'll see what happens. Like, some of these guys, it's it's all on paper at this point. Austin, I mean, that's all we have to go on, right? I mean, we're just, uh, you know, discussing what's on paper. I like the track record. I like the resume of some of these guys. But truly, the product on the field is the most important thing. And recruiting is up there as well. But... We need to see it on the field next fall. Um, on a completely unrelated note, we just wanted to hit on this really quickly before we go, but just the Tennessee McDonald's bag situation. Jeremy Pruitt uh, fired as the head coach there because he got caught <laughs> giving cash to kids in McDonald's bags. And then you have the joke, you know, it's a happy meal, right? Pretty happy meal there that they're handing out, but just an incredible story. And by the way, if Tennessee hired him from Alabama and thought that this is not what they were going to get, now it's pretty sloppy to do it that way and that obvious. But if they, you know, they're firing him for cause, but at the same time, they brought him there to do things like that. Um, so, but the SEC is just screwed up in every way possible. I just wanted to get your thoughts on this story uh, before we wrapped up. This is flat out hilarious. How do you not laugh at this situation? Everyone outside the state of Tennessee is laughing their heads off. What did Tennessee expect when they hired Jeremy Pruitt, one of Nick Saban's main disciples, when he was at Alabama, the king of cheaters? Of course, Jeremy Pruitt is going to follow in his footsteps. Sure enough, recruits are caught getting McDonald's bags full of cash. Uh, you call them Happy Meals? We could have a field day with this. What else would they be? How about Whoppers? 
how about Big Macs? I wonder what the toy was inside, uh, you know, uh, several hundred dollar bills. So this is this is flat out hilarious. And what's a shame is that, of course, nothing will come of it. The NCAA won't do a thing about it. And that's a shame. I wish the national media would start calling the cheaters out more often because someone needs to. We had Jeff Goodman on our podcast last week, former ESPN college basketball analyst, now at Stadium. And I read one of his old interviews when he left ESPN. And something very interesting he said was that when the FBI corruption case broke college basketball, he offered to ESPN to cover it. And they told him not to. They told him to stay away from it, even though he has countless connections and inside info around the college basketball world. And he could have really uh, uh, called out a lot of the cheaters, and they told him not to. So that shows you where ESPN's head is at. But this is just too funny. I, I died laughing when I saw this. Twitter had a field day with it. A lot of media personalities around the country were having a field day with it. So props to Tennessee and Jeremy Pruitt because – uh, we, we all knew they were cheating. That was pretty obvious when Jeremy Pruitt's your head coach. But uh, cash in McDonald's bags, really? They couldn't be more more sneaky about it than that? This situ- whole situation is just hilarious in my book. Oh, it's it's insane. It's hilarious. Um, and that's insane about the Jeff Goodman thing. Um, yeah. It just shows you that it, you know money makes the world go round and how deep this goes because ESPN makes their revenue off of this as well. And... I mean, it's just insane until somebody steps up and says, you know, we don't care about, you know, this amount of money, which is likely never going to happen. Then this thing's not going to get cleaned up unless one of us decides to become a martyr and just start investigating all this stuff. And and, I don't know, literally could have our lives in danger. Um, Then maybe it'll just go on forever. Yeah, for sure. I don't think it'll ever be cleaned up and it's ruining college football and college basketball to a lesser degree. In my opinion, I'll nominate you if uh, if you'd like to be the one to kind of take the bullet and call out the cheaters in the SEC for all the corruption there is down there. But you talked about your life potentially being in danger. That's spot on. They are so morally backwards down there. Football is is all that matters in their life, and it's pathetic. And I wish it wasn't like that, but it is life and death down there. We've seen Alabama-Auburn games, the loser of that game, people get shot and killed. And, uh, you know, that, what was it, the Auburn guy poisoning the 100-year-old Alabama trees or whatever it was? They're just backward down there, and it's pathetic. But it it will take someone, a a reporter or someone on their own, revealing it all and calling out the corruption. But, again, unfortunately, I think there's too much money at stake, and I don't think that'll ever happen. Even the FBI botched it. Yeah. If the FBI can't get it cleaned up, then who will? Seriously. It's insane. Uh, the FBI is a joke in this this regard when you watch that Christian Dawkins documentary. But, man, uh, just absolutely hilarious with the with the Jeremy Pruitt situation in Tennessee, firing him as if they thought he was doing anything different. But there we go. The hypocrisy of collegiate athletics, especially in the South. Uh, <laughs> thought we'd mention that before we go. Um, so, yeah, remember to check us out at TheWolverine.com. The promo code is blue 60 for two months of our premium content for free. You can interact with the thousands of subscribers on our message board with daily discussions, live threads on all these basketball games, football games when it comes around. So check us out there. Promo code is blue 60 and we'll see everyone next week.